portrait work and commercial. <laughs> my, my specialty is portrait and commercial work. Uh, I do a lot of editorial uh, work as well. Most of my, my work goes into, it's with the Fortune 500 brands and things like that of that nature. So mostly advertising based, but there's a big, uh, there's a lot of narrative in my work. Um, what's important to me about my photography and what I do for a living is that it's never just a, a picture of someone on a wall or for God's sakes on, a, on train tracks or something. It's always some type of narrative. And a lot of that narrative is driven both by lens choice and the lighting you're gonna use. Those two things can really change the mood of the photo immediately. Uh, if you want something that's a little bit, I call it a quieter photo, so it's a little bit more somber, uh, a little bit more in, in feelings, you're gonna use softer light, you're gonna use less light, you're gonna let those lights kind of go into a blue tone. If you want something happier, you're gonna let those lights get warmer, you're gonna use a lot of lights and give a, a glowing effect to your, to your subject. Uh, tonight, oh, let me do that. Tonight, what we're gonna do is kind of a, a John Wick uh, inspired uh, portrait. Uh, we're in the studio here in Alexandria and right behind us this way is a, a full uh, psych wall. Now, instead of using that psych wall, which would be fine for this, this portrait, right? It would still sell the story. We're actually gonna shoot on the shipping container wall that has a little bit more grit, a little bit more texture to it. And we're gonna light everything in the scene individually from itself. When I do my lighting setups and I light uh, my shots, I do something a little bit different than most do. Typically, when you get to a, a set, you're gonna put your key light up first, which is your main light. In this case, it's gonna be a boomed light overhead on the beauty dish. I light things from back to front, so it's a little bit different. I'm gonna light my environment first and then build my lights forward to the camera. I don't really know where this, this technique came from for me. The only thing I can relate it to is like growing up, my mom was a painter, and when you paint, you lay down your base layer and you build on top of it that way. When I look at a scene, I look at a photo, that background is that, that base layer, and then I build everything from there. Um, if, we're, if we're shooting on location, if we're shooting with some type of location in mind, we have to make sure we're paying attention to that location and lighting it and treating it as another part of the subject. Because it's very easy just to throw somebody up against this, this shipping container, take a picture and go away. But if we give some thought to how we're gonna light it and how we're gonna shoot it, it'll help bring that narrative together even more. and just give us more of a clear, concise uh, image. So what we're gonna do tonight is start with just a quote unquote natural light photo as if I just showed up, I didn't have any lighting with me at all. Then we're gonna to start to build these lights up one by one, eventually getting to a total of five lights for this one picture. Some things that help sell the narrative is gonna be hair and makeup, the wardrobing, uh, props, all that stuff. And we've gone ahead and done our hair and makeup on our, on our actor here tonight, Aaron, come on in. This is Aaron, he's our, he's our John Wick character who, who got in a fight. <laughs> this is the end of the movie. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So he's going to be our, our narrative. And this is, again, think of this shot as more of a, of a movie poster than just a portrait. And this is what comes back to this whole like cinematic photo thing that I do. It's always kind of, you're, you're, you're bringing in so many things to tell a story. It's like telling an hour and a half long movie with one image. And that's kind of what movie poster work is, that kind of stuff. We want to, we want to create an image that can sell that narrative in just one frame. And that's what we're gonna to do tonight. So we can go ahead and get started. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my Lightroom screen as I shoot so you guys can see the photos as I take them. Uh, for reference tonight, we are shooting, I put out a thing earlier about what camera everyone wanted me to shoot with. Um, and everyone said it was either R5 or the GFX 100. It ended up being tied at 50-50. So I'm gonna shoot the GFX 100 tonight. Uh, and the cool thing about this camera is it's digital medium format, 102 megapixel, insane uh, resolution. But if you can see, I'm actually adapting a Tamron 85 uh, millimeter 1.8 to the body and it covers the sensor fully. So I can use this Tamron glass on the GFX 100 and get some incredible medium format images, but still using a 35 millimeter lens. And it works just fine. That being said, there's our massive file. So as I'm shooting in Lightroom, it may go a little slow. I tend to not use a, take a lot of photos on set. So I'm expecting maybe 25 or 30 tonight. Um, and we'll kind of go through them each photo as they go through the computer. And we'll talk about how we start to bring those light, that lighting you know, up to what the final produced uh, image will be. So I'll go ahead and I'll start sharing my screen. And John, as I'm shooting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a quick note for the viewers. If you yeah. guys have any questions or anything uh, about the process and what he has going on, just drop your questions in the Q&A box. <laughs> Make sure you put it in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll get to those as we go along. 
Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so sharing Lightroom. All right, so we should be looking at my Lightroom screen now. We're tethering in. Um, I haven't done any light tests at all, so we're gonna kind of do this on the fly. So this is, I tried to keep it as, as authentic to what the process would be um, if I just showed up and did a photo. Uh, so we're gonna keep my, my shutter speed at the, the camera's sync speed, which is one, uh, 1 25th of a second. I'm not gonna go into high speed sync or anything like that. I don't think I need to. So I'm gonna keep it there. And I'm gonna start with just that, like I said, the quote unquote, like natural light shot. Um, with uh, medium format, your depth of field is, is way shallower than it would be on a 35 millimeter. So if I want to get some shallow depth of field, I'm probably going to leave it at 2.8. I likely will go to F4 and still be able to blur the background a little bit, even though he's only standing about seven, eight feet off of it. Um, so I'm going to start at 2.8 and kind of see if that's going to be enough in focus for our shot to start with. Okay, so go ahead. You'll stand on your mark right there. That's good. And guys, I'm just gonna, I'm kind of winging it. Uh, you guys can see my, my camera settings on the screen. ISO 200, shutter speed one, uh, 1 25th, uh, aperture 2.8. I can already tell that it's gonna be way too dark. So I'm just gonna increase my, sh uh, my ISO to get it back to a normal exposure here, which is gonna be crazy high, 4,000, that's nuts. And we'll start here. All right, let's take a look at what we got. That's actually a pretty quick transfer. Ooh, that white balance is destroyed. <laughs> um, here, I'm not gonna do any editing tonight, but I'll just do a quick fix of the white balance so it's not the worst thing to see. I'm shooting a white balance uh, 5600. Uh, the strobes I use are the Westcott FJ400s and FJ200s. Uh, recommend using those at um, 5600 to get a good accurate color out of them. Uh, so that being said, this is our natural light shot, which honestly isn't that bad looking, which is hilarious to me. Uh, we'll zoom in, let's take a look, make sure we're sharp. It's gonna take a second to load. Come on, there we go. Yep, it looks sharp. It's a little noisy because we're at ISO 4000 to get this shot. And obviously I don't wanna be at ISO 4000. Uh, so we're gonna start, I'm gonna crank it back to what I would want the ISO to be and then we'll take a look at what that frame looks like. So we can see what the shot looks like without any lights in it and what I go into every shot, uh, what the expectations of. Meaning I want the frame to be almost completely pitch black when I go to take a picture. And then I want all my lights to then be a part of like what makes that photo uh, good. You can go ahead and hop on in. Hey oh. Jonathan, for, for somebody that's new to lighting, um, when we're talking about white balance, what's, what's a couple tools that you like that get your white balance? Pretty accurate. This is where I say I'm supposed to use a gray card because I, I don't. <laughs> I, um, yes, a gray card would be the way to go. Uh, you have your actor hold up a 50% gray card, and that's a good way to balance your white balance using a custom white balance profile in your camera. I know Canon does that by taking a picture and then it sets the white balance. I don't know what Nikon or, or Sony does off the top of my head. Um, I typically leave my white balances all at daylight if I'm shooting because I'm all everything I do is strobe. I don't do natural light photos. In my entire career, you can go through my whole portfolio. There's nothing that's been naturally lit from day one. I taught myself lighting by taking GI Joes and holding flashlights around their head. And then I would take that same idea to, to people. Um, when I look through magazines, I look through photos that I enjoyed looking at, I could always tell they had lighting on them. I would see where the shadows were. I would see where the highlights were. So from, from the very beginning, when I first decided to pursue this as a career, I knew I had to create stops like the ones I saw. So that means learning lighting. And I just taught myself that since day one. Uh, so my white balance is typically at 5600, so I'm gonna use my strobes. If for some reason it's not at 5600, the lowest I usually go is like 4400. That gives it a little bit of a cooled off look, but I usually try to stay in that 5600 range, just for simplicity as well too. Okay, so now I'm back to where my settings will probably end up being for the actual shot with when I use the strobes. So I'm at, 2.8 still, which you guys can see the image still, if it's still up there, yeah. It, I'm getting a little bit of a blur in that background, which I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, shutter speed is still 1 1 25th. That's not gonna change the whole time. Now my ISO is at 200. So we'll see what this frame looks like. It's gonna be black. 
So this is more so the framing or the, the way I want the image to look. Oh, it's locked right there. Yeah. This is what I go into a shot hoping to see. This is what my test shots all look like. You can't see nothing. It's just pretty much a dark frame. And then I start to bring up my lights uh, one by one. We'll start with the backlight. It's a Westcott FJ200. It's a smaller guy. This is just unmodified, just bare bulb. So we're gonna turn this on. And this light is, its only purpose is gonna be to light that uh, shipping container wall. All my lights are in their own groups. I've already did that uh, previous to the shoot. These two side lights are gonna be group B. This should be group C. My key light will be group A. And then I have a fill light that's gonna be group D. So we're gonna start with group C right now. Now Westcott uses a kind of proprietary power uh, number for their, for their lights. It's not like, you know, one fourth of, of power, one sixteenth power, it's just one through nine. So I'm gonna bring C down to, I don't know, 3.5. You wanna step back in? So this should give me a silhouette of him. I can't see them back here. There we go. So we're starting to build up our light on set. So we had that big pop of light. It's a little too uh, hot for me. So taking that three five down to probably a full stop down to two five. I'm also gonna change the position of it a little bit. There we go. All right, Aaron, can you hop back in? That looks good. That should be a little bit cleaner. Again, we're just trying to get a little separation between him and that back, uh, the back shipping container. That's looking good to me. I'm gonna bring it down even more. So we went from 2.5, now we're at two. This is just trying to get rid of any type of distracting hot spots on the on the metal behind him. We might not be able to get rid of all of them, but that's that's actually pretty clean there. Okay, I'm good with that so far. I don't want too much light hitting that wall. We just, we're trying to just kind of bring it up, and I don't want the viewer to see it and know exactly what it is. We just like the texture of it and the the industrial feel to the whole thing. Now the next two lights are gonna be our rim lights. These are gonna kind of wrap him in light and brings out the definition of the jawbone, uh, cheekbones, all of that. It kind of just also helps separate him from the background. So if you have to think about it in layers, this is our first layer, right? Our second layer will be that wrapping light around his chin. Our next layer will be that key light over his head. So that's three layers. And then our fourth layer will be the fill light, kind of just filling in shadows. So now we're gonna start with those rim lights. Like I said, these are in their own group. This is a group B. We're also gonna use gels tonight, just to kind of really hit home this whole action movie vibe. There we go. So those are on B, those are gonna be similar power, or the same power, uh, I should say. Uh, and I'm gonna guess it. We'll start those at 3.5. So we're at 2.8, 1 125th, 1 ISO 200. Uh, background light is at two, a power of two. Rim lights are gonna be at 3.5. Go ahead and hop in. Now just with these rim lights, you're gonna see a really cool effect already. I think. Yeah. So it's already got that menacing kind of vibe to it just by adding those two lights. And we see it just kind of chisels his body away from that wall and it starts to cut into his cheekbones really well and uh, cut into his jawline. Do a quick zoom in. We can take a look and see how just defined that chin and that jawline is now. Once it stops, there we go. So a lot of good texture. Now when you light things from the side, it also brings out a lot of cool skin texture. If you just blast light straight on, you lose all your pores, you lose everything. But you light from the side, you'll see we get all that beautiful texture that we wanna always retain. Uh, I see it all too often with retouching. It goes way too far and the, the skin looks super plastic. We have pores, we have texture to our skin. Let's not lose that stuff, let's keep it in there. And by lighting it from the side, you get that 
totally. Something interesting to look at too is, again, shooting medium format, our depth of field falls off super fast. So you can see his hair right here and his chin is in focus, but just the hair on the back of his neck already blurs out. So it falls off really, really fast. And that's just kind of, that's what makes medium format kind of tricky. So you wanna make sure your focus is getting spot on, um, but we're good. I'm gonna bring those lights down just a tiny, tiny bit. I don't want them to hit that hard. So I was at 3.5, I'm gonna to go to three. And if you notice, there's a little bit of flare coming in on the, on uh, his left side, our right side. So I'm gonna pull that light back just a touch so we can get rid of some of that flare. All right, go ahead and hop on in, sir. That looks good. And that should get rid of that flare and bring down some of those hot spots on his uh, chin or jawline. That's good. We also see we're lighting up the side of his shoulders too, so his suit's getting lit up a little bit more. And it's helping just kind of make sure he stands off of that background as much as possible. So that's our first two layers, right? We have our background lit and that's taken care of. We have the side of him lit and that's taken care of. The next light is gonna be our key light. And what I'm gonna use for the key light is a beauty dish with a grid. Grids help uh, focus the light to a very uh, small designated area. Most of my modifiers are very small. So I wanna light uh, very deliberately in my, in, my, in my lighting. I don't want things kind of spilling all over the place. I don't want, um, for lack of a better term, I don't want pretty light. I want hard kind of contrasty light everywhere. That's gonna help sell this whole narrative again of the whole action movie thing. So my beauty dish is gonna be a smaller uh, modifier overhead and that's gonna have a grid on it. That grid is gonna restrict the lighting. So it only kind of hits right here. That way we don't want it to bleed onto the side and kind of overcompensate for those rim lights. We want a light here and light here. So these are the own uh, defined things, not just all kind of spilling all over each other. Hey, Jonathan, which lights did you uh, gel? Say that one more time. Which lights, which light did you gel? I haven't gelled anything yet. Cool. I will be gelling the rim lights though. All right, so we're gonna bring the key light over. What was that? The same thing? Oh, sorry. Bring the key light over. This is gonna be on a boom. If I can catch it. Man, this thing's heavy. And you're gonna notice also, I'm gonna get this modifier pretty close into him. The closer your modifiers are to your subject, two things happen. The softer the light, and you see the effect of the modifier that much more as it gets closer. As you pull these modifiers away, you start to lose their intended effect. So we want to make sure we're getting our modifiers as close as we possibly can, because that's gonna allow us to see those effects of the modifiers. All the modifiers do separate things. So it's important that we kind of uh, use them in the way that they're intended and show the effects of those modifiers. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see me for a minute too. There we go. What is this? This is a crank one? Oh, this is stupid. <laughs> I feel like I'm turning butter or something. This is, this is dumb. <laughs> I didn't know this was a crank one. <laughs> that looks pretty good there. So you can see, guys, it's, it's roughly, what, three feet away? About three feet from his face. Um, and I'm going to shoot right underneath it. And that's kind of that's how we get that achieved effect of the beauty dish. I wanna get that light really punchy. I wanna see all those, that detail in the skin. I wanna see all those pores so we get it really close and we can turn the power of the light down. So we just illuminate versus lighting. Now, so, uh, yeah. Jonathan, does the grid uh, not block the light? The grid, uh, no, the grid doesn't block the light as, as, uh, necessarily. It just helps focus it in one direction as opposed to letting it spill out. So in my, the way I would look at it is it makes the light more efficient and more directional. Uh, it's gonna restrict it this way and not let it go around uh, the subject. It does eat up some of the power. So I will have to hit this a little bit brighter than I, tend, I probably would. Um, but it'll help just control it to one area. So my, my background lights are at three. My, I'm sorry, my rim lights are at three. 
my uh, shipping container light, the wall light, whatever you want to call it, is at two. And my key light right now, I don't know. I'll put that at three five. Let's see where that's going to sit. That's good there. Hold that. And I'll share my screen as long as this looks good and it doesn't yet. But we're getting there. Do, do, do. One second, you guys. There we go. So I'll go back and forth between the two really fast. I'm not seeing a big change yet. So it's got to up that power more and more and more. That grid really eats a lot of the power up. Should make sure it's firing, to be honest. Did I not turn it on? Did it flash? I don't think it flashed. This, the crank is so stupid. I know it's on. Oh, it's probably on the wrong channel. What channel is this on? Nine. I don't know how they got put on a different channel. Okay, that makes more sense now. All right, we'll start this again because that was really dark and that was kind of weird. There we go. Jonathan, do you meet her? No, uh, I used to. Um, I just learned my lighting afterwards and about a year or two after owning a meter, I just started learning my lighting. Um, I know people do meet her and I, you probably should meet her, uh, but once you kind of get into the swing of things, it just, it just eats up time. Most of my shoots, shoots, it's like 15 minute windows, especially with celebrity portrait. So you don't really have time to sit there and meet her and you just got to get it done and get in and get it out kind of thing. Uh, let's take a look at this one again. That time it fired. There we go. That looks cool. You got a Patrick Bateman thing going on, man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll zoom into this. Let me take a look at what we're doing here. We'll go to 100%. So you can see how that light isn't really spilling around his face. It's staying right here. That's exactly what that grid is achieving for us. Uh, it's, dang, that's super sharp. Um, we still have that cool highlight on the sides. We have that cool highlight on his shoulders. We just bring his face light up a little bit. Makeup looks good too, Jesse. Uh, Jesse Campbell did uh, the bruising. It's not real. It's, <laughs> or, is it? or is it? We'll never know. Um, I think my next thing I'm gonna change, I am gonna change some stuff about the lighting a little bit. I want this rim light to be a little bit higher. So I'm gonna raise those up so it hits more of the side of his head, just a touch more. <laughs> it's gonna look cool when we put the, the colors on them. It's like pink and blue and stuff. It's gonna be the most cliched action poster you've ever seen. <laughs> right, let's try that one more time. See if that light's a little taller now. Yeah, that's a little better. Jonathan, remind us which, which lens you're using. I'm using the Tamron 85 uh, 1.8. So good, we're getting that light to get up a little higher. I'm gonna try to pull those in a little bit closer. As I just said, I wanna get those, those modifiers in as tight as possible. So I wanna get those a little bit closer in. Go ahead and uh, stand in for me, Aaron. Let me just take a look where these need to be here. So shooting with the medium format, my frame is a little bit wider than a typical 85. So it photographs more like a 65 or a 70. So you're, I'm a little bit wider. Um, so I can't get my modifiers in too tight. Uh, if I was shooting on 35 millimeter, it'd be a much skinnier frame and much tighter to him. All right, that looks good there. Let me take a look at that one. It should be a little bit more intense. That's better. So that light's hitting them a little bit harder on the sides. Still super defined, super cut out. Now you'll notice we talked about the light. 
It's all pretty much focused right here with a little bit of light on the shoulders and a little bit of light around the face, which means everything here is, gonna, is pretty dark. We are gonna have him hold a prop gun. I don't wanna lose that in the frame. So what I'm gonna do that is using a, a large parabolic uh, to fill in the shadows. And that's gonna be directly behind me, just kind of blasting straight ahead. That's a large umbrella. This one is, I don't know the size of it. I think it's five feet, nothing, nothing super, super big. That's just gonna help fill in some of those shadows on the front of his body so we don't lose his hands or whatnot in the shot. We're also gonna use my favorite thing, which is atmosphere spray. Uh, this stuff, you can buy it. Most camera shops sell it. If anyone's ever used a fog machine on set, you know, it gets way out of hand really, really quick and you have to kind of wait for fog to clear out and it becomes kind of a mess. This stuff, you can just spray it out into your shot and it automatically gives you fog and this is, it's way, way, way easier to handle. And it actually kind of settles nicely uh, as opposed to kind of just dissipating immediately. So we'll bring up that, that fill light. Jesse, can you spin it back here for me? So large parabolic, like I said, it's not super big. It's gonna probably stay around this height from me. And it's literally gonna be right behind my back just going this way. We're gonna to try to fill in some of that light on the front of him. Just because I'm blocking it doesn't mean the light's not gonna to get to him. Light's just gonna spill everywhere. And we're just kind of filling in a little bit of shadows uh, in his hands. So that's group D. Oh, uh, why uh, parabolic versus large softbox? Uh, parabolic is a little bit less deliberate in the way that it, it projects light uh, onto the subject. Let me do this. Parabolic is a little bit, uh, it's less directional, meaning I'm shooting light into it. It's bouncing around and coming out from there. If I was using a large softbox or a large octa or anything like that, that's very much more directional. And I want this light to be a little less intentional in the scene. Um, this is kind of like, this is, this is replicating what ambient light could potentially look like. So we don't want anything super, super directional, just filling in a little bit of shadow. So I have to do minimal post work uh, later. The whole intention of using all this lighting is to avoid Photoshop later or the, uh, uh, spend five minutes in Photoshop versus an hour trying to touch up stuff. So our powers are all around the three range. Um, we have a power of 3.5 on our key. We have these at three and we have that one at two. So it's all in that three, two range. This one's probably gonna be around half power. So we're in the five range, it's so far away and I'm, I am blocking it. So we want that to come down just a touch to about five. That's still gonna be too bright, I think, but we'll take a look and see what it does. This also kind of replaces, if anyone's been shooting for the last 10 years or so, there was a big trend for many years in commercial, and it still is a trend, but it's not as prevalent, of using a ring light in uh, conjunction with st uh, strobes, a giant ring light in the front of your thing, and you shoot that way. It's kind of difficult, it's heavy. Uh, this kind of solves that problem, because it's a little bit, it's obviously not attached to my camera, and I'm still gonna get that on-axis fill light that I'm trying to achieve. Go a little bit this way, there we go. Let's see what we got. Yeah, it's actually pretty close. It's probably a little too bright, but I'll, I'll end up bringing that down. But now we see his hands and he's, he's becoming alive in the shot. We don't have, oops, we don't have that dark area down here. Now, while that's a lot more moody, and I do like that, I can also achieve that in post with just a little bit of vignetting so we don't lose any of the detail information in his hands in the shot. This one that we just did, it's a little too bright for my taste. I do like that we're getting, um, some, some highlights in the eyes, but I don't, I just want to bring that down a lot more. So that's at five. We're gonna bring that down probably to the three range as well. Everything's gonna be in the, near the same power. We just want a subtle amount of light hitting them, not a ton. I've never used a focus beep before. It's kind of, it's kind of nice. Knowing when, when it's in focus. There we go. So that's a little bit more subtle in its, in its uh, approach. It's not as super washed out. We still have the catch lights in the eyes, which I like. They're just a little bit less noticeable, which is, which is good for me. 
Um, okay, let's bring in prop gun. This is not a real gun, everyone. This is a prop. No way that that. Hey, John. We'll have that. Um, now this is the part of the shoot where I start to direct, and it becomes less of a photo shoot, more of a more of a movie set, more of a directorial thing. Because now we have our lighting. It's now it's selling the story. Um, so in this, I want you kind of you'll be down a little bit with your your body's good there. You'll have your chin down a little bit low, and you're going to be kind of glancing up at me to the side. Bring your face this way a little bit more. Drop your chin and eyes exactly right there. Go ahead and pull back the, yep, and just have that be your shot. Hey, Jonathan, people were questioning if you could, we could see your screen. Yeah. Oh, you can't see the screen? Yeah. Oh, sorry. My bad. A lot of things going on over here. A lot of things. There we go. I'll go back through what I said. So this one's a little too bright for me kind of washes them out, we lose that mood, we lose those, those defined light sources. It just kind of becomes almost like a flash on camera approach. And in this one, the, the, the frame that we're gonna go with, we still, we have some light in his hands. He's still um, in that moody light. We just don't wash him out. He's not just getting blown out by the uh, on access light. All right, that's good. You know, bring your chin down and kind of glance up to me. Hold that. Good. Excellent, 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 excellent. I, I see you sort of uh, bending a bit at the knees. Do you suggest eye level, below eye level? Oh, I'm just really tall. <laughs> I'm 6'4", so I, have, I bend down for everybody. Okay. Um, I also do single point focusing and then I recompose. Uh, because I'm not using a native lens on the body, I don't get eye autofocus. So I'm using single point, center focus, and then recomposing, which that's what I've always done. All right, that's looking great. Light looks good. Uh, waiting for it to sharpen up. These files are huge. There we go. That's crazy sharp. That looks great. So face is fully in focus. Shoulders are losing a little bit of focus, which I'm, in this case, I'm okay with. We'll go down to the hands. Because his hands are on the same uh, focal plane as his face, they're sitting off of his body, so it's all in the same focal. We'll have his hands in focus. Chest goes out of focus a little bit, which is kind of a cool effect. Uh, the two important things are in focus, face and the hand with the gun. Let's give me a few more of those. Good. Go ahead and bring me a straight on one with the chin down too. That's good. Excellent. Uh, let's try one pointing it at me. I feel good about that. So just one hand doing, yeah. Hold that, bring it a little bit lower. There you go. Excellent. So his hands in that one are gonna completely be out of focus. Or they should be at least. And the lights on that is gonna be kind of weird. Yeah, you can see totally blurred out, nothing there, but face is good and sharp. So let's start to bring this atmosphere. I like the um, I like the chin straight down more than off to the side. I think that's a little that's a better, it's a little bit more commanding of a look. So now we we'll start to bring up some of the atmosphere. Um, we'll start with the spray first, and then we're gonna gel these rim lights, uh, pinks and blues, and that should kind of set this whole action thing around a little bit better. Jesse is going to be my fog assistant. Now the trick with this fog stuff is you wanna make sure it stays between the lights and your actor or your subject or your model, whatever. So we don't want it necessarily falling too far forward. We wanna keep it kind of back in this world. That way those rim lights light it up and we'll be able to see it. If once it starts getting toward the camera, it's gonna go in front of your subject. It's gonna make your shots look out of focus. All right, Aaron, you can, you can jump in. Just go really wide with it. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're gonna keep it kind of right in this area right there. Go ahead. We won't need a ton. We should break it first. <laughs> That's good, thank you. And let's see if it does anything. Sometimes you don't really see it. And it's a very subtle, subtle, subtle thing. So if you look in the top corner, yeah, you can't really see it. Once we put the colored, the gels on there, we'll start to see a little bit better. Let's try one more hit 
just really hit it hard. That's a cool shot though. <laughs> That's good. Awesome. Yeah, that's better. We can see it there. So that just took a lot more than I would usually would assume. So we see a little bit there. Now, when I go to edit this and bring out some of the texture and that detail, all that smoke will come out even more. Uh, let's put some gels and really start to bring this out even, even, even more. So I have two gels, a pink one, blue one. The way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to keep these on my lights. I'm going to gel uh, the flash tube inside of the modifier so we still get a nice soft light but it's gonna be a colored uh, gel soft light. So I'll turn this to the camera. I'll bring this down. So all I'm literally doing is right inside of this, I'm gonna shove this in between the light and the modifier. I'm sorry if that crinkly sound is annoying. Jonathan, I'm gonna try to cover it as best as I can. Jonathan, is there, is there a science behind the how you choose your colors? No, not really. I, actually, I don't do a lot of gel work. I find gels to be very difficult. Um, but in this aspect, it's such a stylized shot that I think the gels kind of work for it. What I'll do is, what am I doing here? So you can see that, that just having that little bit of a gel in there, I think, is that showing up? Or does it just look at white, white light? Yeah, you'll see it in a second. But it's filling this modifier up with that pink light and that's what we're going for, the intended effect. So we'll use that pink one on this side. We'll throw that back up. And I got a little blue one for the other side. And these aren't any like fancy gels. You can get these off Amazon. These are basically just like transparency sheets that you can get like a pack of 50 for two or three bucks. get in there there we go i've never had one melt so that's good so tonight tonight <laughs> okay so because there's gels in those lights i'm probably gonna lose a little bit of power so i'm probably gonna end up uh upping that power just a touch all right aaron hop on in sir let's take a look what we got oh not yet we'll do the spray in a second but that over there is all messed up so I'm gonna turn this around a little bit more this way. We just want these lights focused on the side of his uh, body and the side of his uh, face. <laughs> That's so stupid looking. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. Yeah, and you can't super, super see it. I think I gotta up that power like crazy. There's a little bit of color in his hair, not much. There's a little bit of color over here. So I'm gonna go high. I'm gonna bring that power up pretty high. So that was at three before. And I don't know, we're gonna double it, go to like six. Let's see what that's gonna be like. That's gonna be out of control, but we'll see. Hold that, that's a big old pop of light. There we go. So now we start to see the effect of that color. Like I said, we probably would have to bring it up just because there's something in front of the light now. Even though it's just a color, it's not necessarily something that's dimming the light, it's something between the light and your subject. So there's gonna be a little bit of loss of, um, of effect. So the pink side looks good. Blue side looks kind of just like light. So let's see, yeah, it's coming out blue. I might try to double that one up a little bit. So I'm gonna mix blue and red. Is that pink? Purple? Purple's not a real color. Should I go into that whole thing? If anybody out there wants to know, <laughs> purple's not a real color. It does not follow a mathematical <laughs> spectrum equation. <laughs> Everyone interprets purple differently. Now you learn something. 
It's the color with the most, the least integrity. All right, let's try that. <laughs> it's such a stupid fact to know. That's why it's not on the rainbow and violet is. Go ahead and stand in. Oh, won't, won't more light from the jail wash out the, I mean, one more light from the main light wash out the jail? No, because we're, we're controlling it where it spills. So that main light should only be lighting the front of his face while these gels should only be lighting the sides of his face. Okay, that's good. Let's see if it does anything. Yeah, the blue's just, the blue's always gonna be hard to see because it's gonna, it's gonna take the, the skin tone and kind of roll with it. The pink looks great. Blue's there, but it's just not as evident. It's just kind of to be expected. Um, yeah, it's just what it is. The blues is going to mix in with hair. It's going to mix in with skin tone. It's going to just kind of lean that way. Also, your camera uh, is going to play blues and, and pinks differently as well. But the pink looks great. So let's do some of the fog and see what that effect's going to turn into. So get a lot behind him and get a little bit low in front of him. <coughs> Excuse me. That's good. Looks good, hold that. Let's see what we got. Hopefully that's gonna be cool. Yeah, look at that. So that color's gonna help pop that, help pop that smoke a little bit better. And that looks great. It came out really oh, good. Jonathan, the, the sort of back and forth that you're going through right now, is this common? Um, with your, when you sit down for your live sessions that you are back and forth setting, resetting, um, fine tuning, things like that? Or do you set up your setting and then that's what you go to when you go to the shoot? Yeah, if, if this was a real set, you know, all this, all this, the work we're doing now would have been done beforehand before the talent even shows up. So when they get on set, it's just fire, 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 go, go, go. Um, yeah, like I said earlier, often you don't have a lot of time to do these kind of uh, projects. Um, so it's like you have your 10 or 15 minute window, you show up two hours early, you get everything ready to go, and then it's just go, go, go. And you just, you look at the camera afterwards. You're not even like, you're not even like chimping in between pictures. You're just going, 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 going. Um, on a big commercial set, this is typical. This is, the only difference would be I would have someone let me do this. The only difference between uh, this and a commercial shoot is I have someone at my computer uh, with the client looking at each frame as they come, uh, running uh, digital tech. And that digital tech is going to sit there and he's going to put base edits on the photos as they come in. We're going to look at things like space for copy around the photo, space for logos, all that kind of stuff, making sure that they're meeting uh, the client's requirements. Uh, so if you had another version of me sitting at the laptop this whole time, that would make this shoot pretty authentic to what it is. And shoot, especially shooting tethered. Uh, commercial stuff, 99% of it's gonna be a tethered shoot, whether that's actually physically wired to a computer or it's going wirelessly to an iPad. Someone on the set uh, from the client side has access to the images as I take them. It just makes everything go a lot more efficient. It makes everything just go a lot smoother. And just to touch on, on the tethering, you mentioned that it tethers a little different with this Fuji. Yeah, the Fuji tether is different than the other uh, brands. You have to download uh, like their tethering client that automatically installs itself into Lightroom. Uh, I don't use Capture One. I have used Capture One. I don't really see a massive difference in that uh, with Lightroom. But I think with uh, Capture One, it has a native, uh, it natively can tether without having to download the, 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 the client or whatever you have to download for this. But I downloaded it today and it's working fine. I don't, I don't see any issues with it. And it's actually, you know, for files that are coming out of the camera that are roughly 220 or 230 megabytes a piece, it's handling the tether really well and it's going through, you know, fairly fast. All right, go back to this. I'm just gonna zoom in and we'll take a look at our sharpness, make sure we're good there, which I think we are. Yeah, as you can see, super sharp. A lot of cool texture, a lot of cool detail. Just wish we had that blue popping a little bit harder. 
but that's that's usually the, that's usually what happens with blue. Blue is always kind of tricky. Um, the pink side looks great. If I had another pink one, I would just probably do pink on both sides. But I don't think I have another pink gel with me in my bag. Uh, yeah, you can ask. I don't think they have. Yeah, just like a, yeah, pink would be great. While I have this image open, let's go back to. And look at the before and after here. Whoops. So you can see fairly large difference there uh, in between a natural light and a strobed shot. Uh, natural light shot doesn't look bad, actually. It looks better than I thought it was going to look. But we're also shooting at a super high ISO there, uh, 4,000. So our shots are going to be a little bit not as clean. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be noisy because it's 4,000 ISO. Um, but using that lighting, we see a lot more texture and detail uh, in the skin. We can be a little bit more deliberate about what we want our photo uh, to kind of look like. Um, it's starting to sharp. It's trying to sharpen up now. It's just massive files that are that are hanging up a little bit here, so we can see a better a better look between the two. That one's sharp, and yeah, we got to be able to take them off of those. Just shove them in the oh. Oh, so. boop, we got pink. All right, let's, let's try to do the whole pink on both sides then. Okay, let's see if this works. In there. There we go. I hope they didn't want to keep that. <laughs> All right, let's try one. Let's try and see if that does anything. It's a little bit lighter pink, but it's still pink. Yeah, we'll do some of that too. All right, we got our gun. What's wrong? Oh. All right, let's see if this works out. That's good. Does it work? Yeah, it does work. Now we have pink on both sides. I like that a lot. That looks cool. How's the gun look? Gun looks good. It's cocked back nicely. And one day it'll sharpen up. One day soon. <laughs> That's kind of the, the crappy part about using these the medium format. I don't care how good your computer is, it's always going to slow down just a touch when you're using these massive files. There we go. That looks great. Um, I can probably bring the power of that down just a touch. Or actually, I'll probably bring my ISO down just a little bit. I'm at 200. I'll, I'll go down to 100 and see what that looks like. Uh, I think we're going to lose the gun for a, a shot. And just give me like an arms crossed dead at me thing. Just, just real. Yeah. So as far as the camera goes, we're just changing the ISO. One uh, 125 ISO. That should help those colors come out just a little bit more. Yeah, I like that. In the next shot, we're going to do that fog one more time, and that will probably be our last uh, frame for this. Let's go ahead and fog it up. Fog it up. Drop your chin just a little bit more. Real menacing stuff. That's good. Hold that. Yeah, it looks great. So the fog kind of helps sell it. Just adds that, <laughs> that one other element of just atmosphere to the shot. Um, 
we'll keep this frame there. We'll go back to that. I don't know why it went black and white on me. There we go. We can see our before and after. You know, like I said, the 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 natural light shot doesn't look terrible. It really doesn't. Um, but what you start to deal with is I can't go to a shoot and trust they're going to have somewhat decent lighting. I got to be able to bring my own and know exactly what that way I can control what my shot looks like. I'm not stuck with whatever the environment uh, gives me. So being able to control our light, create our own scene, uh, just gives you a little bit more versatility as a photographer. Um, you're not, you don't have to worry, worry about weather. You can create, we can create sunlight with these, with these strobes. We can put a warming gel on one of these and have that light spill into the camera, which then kind of looks like sun. So if it's a rainy day, we can make those clouds look sunny and look bright. There's so many things to do with lighting. And it's not, like I said earlier, it's not just about lighting up your subject. It's about using these as a tool to help tell your narrative. Um, all that rim lighting, all that front lighting, all that stuff just helps sell this kind of gritty, um, stylized process look that you see in uh, cinema and cinematography, you see in movie posters, you see in all that stuff. And that's kind of what we're trying to go for tonight. And it looks hey John, good. When you, uh, do you use any type of color profiles or, or flat? Do you shoot flat and then um, you know, like cinematic, they shoot flat and then they take care of the colors afterwards. Do you have- Yeah, I shoot everything uh, in a flat profile and raw. If I do, if I am shooting video, depending on the, the, the camera model, if I'm shooting Sony, or I'm sorry, uh, Canon cinema stuff, it's all like C-Log, so all super, super flat. I want as much information in the camera, let alone, but less of it thinking for me. I want to handle the colors. I want to handle the sharpness and the contrast, all that stuff. I don't want Fuji or Canon or Nikon, Sony, whatever. I don't want their algorithms to figure that out for me. I want control of that. So everything is shooting in RAW. I'm shooting at 16-bit uh, uncompressed RAW tonight, which is a massive, beautiful file. Uh, but yeah, everything is very, very flat. Everything is RAW. I want as much um, uh, information to deal with when I go to, to edit. What are what are some of your uh, what are some of your go to um, focal lengths? Sure, uh, I tend to shoot a lot at thirty five forty five. Those are my my real go to. So I want to, most of my work is environmental portrait, and the location plays a giant role in creating the photo. So I want to show enough of the location in my photo that. But at the same time, I don't want to lose the subject in it. So that 35 millimeter, 45 millimeter range works really well in that. If I was shooting at 24 or 15, then you just lose your subject in the environment. There, there are use cases where that's important. Like you do, sometimes you do want to have a drastically wide angle kind of fish eyed look uh, from a 15 millimeter lens. But usually 35, 45, 85, those are my, my sweet spot uh, lenses that I tend to, to shoot with the most. Um, let's see. Any other questions coming in? Uh, we um, so we have a we have your uh, outdoor um, yes Saturday coming up. Yeah, so Saturday uh, from one to three at Navy Yard in DC, we're going to do kind of something similar outdoors. Uh, we're going to go a little bit more commercial with that. That's going to be uh lifestyle fitness driven but still the same type of lighting uh, i've been checking the weather we're going to have a really cool kind of cloudy moody day so we're really going to be able to do some uh, interesting effects with lights that day and bringing out this really really kind of dark cool rich textured cloud uh or clouds on the scene so we're going to be walking around navy yard and doing some really cool uh stylized commercial portraits Great. so if you are in the dc area and you're watching this tonight Try to come Saturday night or Saturday because you're going to learn a lot on Saturday, how to control all of these things outside. And even if it wasn't going to be a sunny day, we're still using all this lighting outside because you can still balance ambient with strobe and create something that looks really just kind of striking. Guys, please don't miss that. Uh, we have a few spots left, so please check out our website. Um, you can find a link to uh, sign ups there. Um, um, also, we have our uh, focus on the story emerging uh, storytellers grant going on call for proposals there's information on our website for that um, i want to thank tamron um, for being our sponsor tonight helping set set things up um, um, they've been with us for four years and um, you know they've, they've done a great job uh, these last four years 
Um, we also have a couple events coming up as well um, on June 17th, uh, Rethink Tomorrow, a conversation with uh, Swedish photographer Helen Schmitz. And then also we have um, a Fujifilm will present a Nina Robinson um, on Finding Your Voice um, talk. Uh, so definitely check out our, our website for those things. Jonathan, I want to thank you again uh, for coming out and sharing your expertise. Um, the shots look great. Are you going to have this shot anywhere on any of your... Yeah, this will be on my socials for sure with a, behi a before and after. Um, then a fully edited version of it will be on social. So follow me at Jthorpe Photo on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and also, I just want to say thank you to you guys that focus on, on the story. And, and thank you so much to Tamron. Uh, I've been with Tamron now, I don't know, seven or eight years. And I fully, they're just, they're, the lenses are beautiful. And they really do support their photographers really, really well. So I really do appreciate them being a part of all this as well. All right. Well, we thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Shedrick Pell with Focus on the Story. Uh, you can find my work at s.p.media.com. Um, Jonathan, we can't wait to see you uh, on Saturday, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. Thank you so much. See you guys.